Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. We've got a lot to cover this week. It seems that the tech companies have gotten past that beginning of the year, January and February lull, and are starting to gear up for new launches and announcements again. AMD has new Threadripper Pro CPUs, but only for true professionals. Apple showed off an M1 Ultra chip that's basically two of their M1 Max chips fused together, and there might be new Ryzen 5000 CPUs launching soon, as well as the long-awaited RTX 3090 Ti from NVIDIA. All this, and it's daylight saving savings day, spring forward time yet again, at least in the parts of the world where that archaic tradition still lingers. So I think today uh, I'll have some coffee to make up for that lost sleep. And now I'd best proceed with the tech news post haste, since there's one less hour to enjoy it this weekend. You'd think after a lifetime of doing daylight savings, there'd be something to show for it in my bank account. <laughs> Lame joke to end the thing, but it's still, it's a joke nonetheless. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by Corsair's new Xenion Monitor, the 32QHD165, featuring an ultra-slim 32-inch 2560x1440QHD screen with one millisecond moving picture response time, a 165Hz refresh rate fast IPS panel, quantum dot technology, and 100% sRGB, 100% Adobe RGB, and 98% DCI-P3 color gamut coverage for more vivid natural colors, HDR400 support, and convenient features like the integrated multi-mount point for cameras, mics, or lighting built into the stand to round out the package so for more on Corsair's Xenion Monitor, click the sponsor link in the video description. Let's begin with Tuesday's announcement from AMD. The Threadripper Pro 5000 WX series of CPUs have finally arrived. Formerly known by their code name, Chagall, and high-end desktop PC enthusiasts got excited for like a minute before realizing that when AMD adds Pro to something, it means they're catering more to the business crowd than the hobbyists building systems at home. So while these new CPUs have drool-worthy specs, up to 64 cores and 128 threads, boosted clock speeds, an improved 8-channel memory controller, shadow stacked technology to mitigate buffer overflow issues, and continued compatibility with socket WRX80 motherboards, there are also significant downsides for PC builders who enjoyed prior versions of Threadripper CPUs, specifically the non-pro variants that, while expensive, were not as ridiculously overpriced as enterprise hardware can often be. Since AMD's chiplet-based design with Ryzen CPUs has been well known for a while, many assumed that it was only a matter of time before those Zen 3 chiplets, the ones in Ryzen 5000 series, desktop CPUs were integrated into the next generation of high-end desktop CPUs under the Threadripper name. But we were hoping for more TRX40 compatible CPUs, which is the platform for Threadripper non-pro 3000 series CPUs like the 32-core 3970X that I use in my main editing PC. The market for that elite tier of consumer PC builds, the high-end desktop, seems to have dried up with the advent of higher core count mainstream Ryzen CPUs, so AMD opted to allocate their chiplets to Threadripper Pro 5000 WX series CPUs that they can sell for a lot more money. How much more isn't even clear, as Lenovo has an exclusive deal to sell the new CPUs in their pre-built systems at launch, but it's assumed that that exclusive will expire eventually and DIY builds will be possible. MSI probably wouldn't be designing their first workstation WRX80 motherboard if that wasn't the case, but there's no word on when they'll be available or what pricing will be like. We can make an educated guess though, the previous Gen 64 core 3995 WX still goes for well over $6,000 on Amazon, and motherboards were originally about $1,000 each, although they can be found for about $900 or so now. So it'll likely cost you ten dollars to start for a well-specced 64-core 5995 WX build. Ouch. Speaking of things that are painful, Apple hosted their first event of 2022, titled Peak Performance on Tuesday, where they showed off new Apple products. An iPhone SE that uses the A15 Bionic chip, the same as the iPhone 13, shipping March 18th and starting at $429. A new iPad Air running on M1 silicon for $600, and most notably the M1 Ultra, a new variant of their in-house designed SoC that marries two M1 Max chips together with an Ultra Fusion bridge that provides 2.5 terabytes per second of bandwidth. Think of Ultra Fusion as Apple's version of Infinity Fabric that AMD Ryzen CPUs use to communicate between chips, but with a way less cool name. Still, it's an impressive piece of hardware, featuring 20 CPU cores with 16 high performance cores and 4 high efficiency cores, and 64 GPU cores, with support for up to 128 gigabytes of unified memory and a 32 core neural engine for machine learning. The M1 Ultra will initially ship in the new Mac Studio desktop box, a larger Mac Mini with active cooling, and in what I'm being told 
old as an earth-shattering decision by Apple, actual ports to plug things into. The Mac Studio costs two grand with an M1 Max chip, four grand with the full fat M1 Ultra, and double that to eight grand if you fully spec it out because Apple seems to make most of their money by charging two to four times the market price for basic upgrades, like $800 for 64 gigs of memory, or 1200 for an additional four terabytes of SSD storage. There was a new 27 inch studio display as well that sells for $1600, but thankfully comes with a stand this time around. It's just another 400 bucks if you want that stand to be height adjustable or to adapt it to a vase amount. It's always something with those Apple upsells. One word of advice though, I wouldn't trust those Apple performance charts that they showed off personally. They tried not to overwhelm folks with too much data and they took it way too far. Who needs axis labels or a basic explanation of how these systems were tested anyway? And at least Apple helped AMD out by making those Threadripper Pro 5000WX series CPU prices seem much more reasonable. Speaking of overpriced technology, we might finally see Nvidia's long rumored RTX 3090 Ti launch this month. March 29th is the date now, according to rumors from the Chip Hell forums. And I guess I shouldn't say rumored since Nvidia announced the card during CES and then just seemed to forget their promise to share more info by the end of January. Better late than never though, since RTX 40 series rumors are already leaking out and overlapping with that would be pretty embarrassing. Incidentally, the also rumored RTX 3070 Ti 16 gig variant has apparently also been canceled, a great blow to the two or three people who were excited for that card, but hopefully this means we can soon confirm or debunk many of the RTX 3090 Ti scuttlebutt that has been bandied about recently, like if the two gigabyte GDDR6X memory modules run too hot, or if the full scale GA102-350 GPU with 10,752 CUDA cores will actually pull 450 watts or more of power. The embargo timeline leaked by videocards.com indicates that the launch announcement, reviews, and for sale date all go live at the same time, 6 a.m. Pacific on the 29th though. So if you're trying to beat the scalpers, you probably won't be able to check those reviews first before you commit thousands of dollars and a year of indentured servitude to pay for the card, which is the rumored low end price right now, ballpark. And then on Wednesday, a picture surfaced on Chinese social media that seems to be the AMD Ryzen 7 5800X 3D. The eight core 3D vCache enabled CPU that AMD says will be way better at gaming because of the 3D vCache. The poster on Bilibili claims that the chip does not support overclocking, which would be a departure from all the other CPUs with the Ryzen moniker. So many have asked what gives and if this is even legitimate info. But lo, tech power speaketh and claims that they have verified the rumor and that AMD is asking motherboard makers to remove support for 5800X 3D overclocking at the UEFI BIOS level. There are several possible reasons, but most likely it's because the CCD located beneath the added 3D vCache layer outputs heat and they wanna keep cache temperatures within a comfortable range to maintain stability or prevent potential degradation. It's true that clock speed increases can only push gaming performance so far if bottlenecks exist elsewhere. So it could be that through extensive testing, AMD has figured out that sweet spot between frequency, temperature, and performance, and that operating beyond those parameters leads to quick instability or even lower performance. Hopefully we'll find out one way or another come April when AMD is expected to launch the 5800X 3D for $450 MSRP alongside nine other CPUs that will fill out the lower end of their lineup. This includes four core, six core, and eight core CPUs labeled as 5000 series for Zen 3 based chips and 4000 series for Zen 2. It's a bit of a mixed bag though, as AMD is using chips codenamed Cezanne, AKA the same chips from their 5600G and 5700G APUs for the 5700, 5500, and 5100 CPUs, meaning those will only have half the cache and only PCI Express 3.0 support compared to Vermeer based CPUs like the 5600 and 5600X. They'll have the iGPUs disabled too, which kind of sucks and would have made it slightly less of a trade-off. While I'm glad that AMD is finally adding current gen CPUs to the low end of their stack, it's also less exciting because next gen is already on the horizon and all of these chips slot into AM4 motherboards that will be eclipsed by the AM5 launch later this year. WCCF Tech says AMD will announce the new CPUs on March 15th with some launching April 4th and the 5800X 3D going up for sale on 420, which should be a really, yeah, it should just, just a really good day.
Speaking of a good day, why not take a load off yourself? Relax and get comfortable as we slip into some tech briefs. First, an article I found to be quite interesting. How to Geek took a closer look at used GPUs and how they might degrade or wear out from heavy use. Specifically, the kind of use you'd see with 24-7 cryptocurrency mining or running something like folding at home. The short answer is that heat is bad, but there's also a hierarchy of failure. The fans are typically the first to go, followed by thermal compound, which can dry out and crack, then components giving out like solder or capacitors, and finally, the much more rare failure of the GPU silicon itself. Oak Ridge National Labs said the heavily used GPUs in their supercomputers could die after just three years, but hotter running GPUs were more prone to failure. All good things to keep in mind if you're keeping an eye on the used GPU market, which will hopefully get Get more and more appealing in the next few months. Friend of the show Kyle, aka Bitwit, posted a video on Tuesday about RGB software causing PCs to crash, and it's worth a watch if you've had instability in an RGB enabled system. It turns out RGB software often piggybacks other RGB software into an installation for compatibility purposes, causing mysterious uninvited software to appear on your installed apps list, like Patriot Viper M.2 SSD RGB, even though you don't have a Patriot component in your entire build, and uninstalling that app specifically specifically has caused many commenters on Kyle's video to rejoice as their long undiagnosed random BSOD problem was finally solved by removing it. So well done Kyle, and check out the video, it's linked in the description. Gamers Nexus posted an update to the Artesian build saga on Wednesday, revealing that the embattled system integrator has now shut down completely and has rather unceremoniously fired all 50 or so of their employees. It's a sad story for those affected, as many called out from the get-go, now ex-CEO Noah Katz absolutely deserved to be held accountable for his behavior and decision making in handling the scandal, but now dozens of people are jobless as a result. Gamers Nexus was prepared to offer Katz an exclusive video, an opportunity to recover from the situation by apologizing, offering reconciliation, or exhibiting even the smallest amount of self-awareness, but he's seemingly more interested in grabbing sushi with Steve while his ex-employees search the classified ads for a new job so they can feed their families. If you happen to be an ex-employee, Steve is working with several companies to find new positions for those who lost jobs. Much credit to him for doing that, and the contact info for that purpose is in their video, which is linked in the description. If you're an ex-Artesian Builds customer, you might have no idea about the business closing or any of this mess, or how it might affect your warranty, because Noah still hasn't bothered to reach out and let anyone know that his business is shutting down. LimeWire is a name that comes from the internet's shadowy past, a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing app that rose in popularity sometime after Napster proved how much cooler the internet could be when you could get any MP3 you ever wanted for free. Although the OG LimeWire shut down in 2010, a service with LimeWire's name and logo is relaunching to bring all that stuff back and make the internet cool again. Except it's not, it's actually the exact opposite. LimeWire's intellectual property was bought by two Austrian dudes who are now launching it as an NFT marketplace, with prices listed in US dollars and the ability to buy the damn things with a credit card. So LimeWire, originally a place where you could get unlimited copies of cool digital things for free, will now be a place where you can get limited copies of dumb digital things that cost real money. Just look how far we've come. Microsoft has been trying to get people to use Windows 11 with peculiar methods like forcing you to have a Microsoft account or that feature where your old games just don't work anymore. But now they might have some actual bait for us, file explorer tabs. I know, it's the best news ever and something that you'd think would have already been added since tabbed internet browsing has been around for a very, very, very long time now. I have to wonder if there will be new memes now about having too many file explorer windows open. We can only dream. Windows Insiders already have access to the feature in the latest build, and if all goes well, it will roll out to the rest of the world with the next major feature update for Windows 11, expected to ship in the second half of this year as version 22H2. Speaking of Windows, Steam Deck has added Windows drivers for their popular handheld gaming device, which is, at its core, a computer. And computers are cool because they are flexible and allow us to install other software onto them if we want, unless it's an Apple computer, of course. But now, we'll likely start seeing performance comparisons between Windows and SteamOS on Steam Deck. And hopefully there will be a bunch of people who are inexplicably zealous about one or the other, and then they can fight for our amusement. 
And finally, celebrated hip hop artist and fellow Diamond Bar resident Snoop Dogg announced this week that he would be joining FaZe Clan, the gaming organization that has been around since 2010 with more than 450 million followers on social media. Snoop will take a seat on the board of directors at the company, valued at 1 billion US dollars, and my hope is that he rolls them a fatty and gets them to chill out with a talk about the emerging Web3 community and exciting plans to create together in the metaverse, because I don't think even Snoop Dogg can talk me into thinking that those things are cool or valuable. But there you have it guys, tech news for the week with all the dumb parts edited out. If you liked it, hey, click that like button. And if you're feeling even more communicative, your feedback is always welcome. So please feel free to leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested. And check out my store at paulshardware.net for high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, mugs for coffee, and more. And if you're not subscribed, maybe subscribe, that'd be cool. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.